It is time to bring in Arthur Schwartz. It's time for the Food Maven. Arthur Schwartz joins us, uh, of course, every Monday morning, just about every Monday morning. Uh, we rebroadcast Arthur uh, on the weekends and also uh, after our noontime uh, news hour. Uh, good morning there, Arthur. Good morning. And if you hear any birds now, it's because I'm sitting outdoors because I finally got out of Brooklyn <laughs> and got out of my apartment and drove down to visit my nephew and niece and their children. And one of the four-year-olds said to me a couple of weeks ago, you know, we're all healthy here, Uncle Arthur. You can come visit. So I, we did. And, yeah, everybody's healthy here, thank God. But... Um, I'm outside Philadelphia in a gorgeous suburb, but they have a big piece of property here. So I'm sitting under a pergola covered in trumpet vine, which is not yet filming. And there are a lot of birds around here. I probably should learn more about the bird songs myself. So um, it was Father's Day, and so we had to make a nice meal for Father's Day for the father here, my cousin, my nephew Brian. And... Um, I'm glad I did this. I recommended to him some, hmm, I don't know, it's got to be at least six or eight weeks ago, uh, he had an occasion to celebrate that maybe he should buy steaks from DeBrago. You know, I've been talking about this for the, 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 the whole coronavirus period yeah. because that's where I've been getting my meat uh, delivered to my door for 10 bucks on, by FedEx. And they're the, the best steaks, the best pork chops, the best, I must say, I don't like the hot dogs. And I didn't like the Italian sausage. I'm very picky about Italian sausage. Are you saying something, Marshall? No, that's the birds. Oh, I thought I heard you. Oh, that, that's the birds. There are a lot of birds here, including an owl that we only hear at, at, at dusk. <laughs> anyway, the girls did not know that that was an owl. Now I've keyed them in so they can hear the owl. Um, the girls are now four and six and a half. Sydney was very thrilled to learn the other day that she's actually six and a half now, not just six. And um, so uh, Brian um, had some these unbelievable steaks. They're 45-day dry-aged. In this case, they were boneless strip steaks, otherwise known as a New York uh, strip steak or a shell steak. I mean, they have a lot of names. If it has a bone in, it's usually called a Kansas City strip steak. I'm not sure why. I've been to Kansas City, and I did not get that steak. Actually, side note here, the other day on one of the – you know, well, I don't know. One of these TV shows where they go around the country and eat in different places. And uh, I'm looking at this steak, unbelievable looking steak that they're showing on TV. And I'm saying, oh, I have to find out where that is. And they, it ends up, it's this restaurant in Kansas City that I've been to where the steak was mediocre at best. So, you know, TV cameras can be, and, and TV reporters can be a little, I don't know, what you want to say. Anyway, so we had steak. We had an unbelievable steak because it was cooked on uh, on an outdoor grill, which I can't do at home. In fact, uh, Bob has uh, discouraged me from buying these steaks again because they are prime meat and really, really, really well marbled. And uh, when I cook them at home, they create so much smoke that I have to open all the windows and put on all the fans. And the last time I did it, it, it we opened the front door of the apartment to let out some of the smoke. And it was so bad that it set, set off the smoke <laughs> alarm in the hallway. And my neighbors came rushing out because <laughs> they expected to see a fire in the hallway. It was only my cooking steak. Uh, so you we, they, we cooked them outdoors. But I have to say, oh, and Brian made unbelievably good chopped salad with feta and heirloom tomatoes and cucumber. He's very good at that. And, um, and he's very good at dressing all these things. And, and zucchini that I was skeptical of because they were enormous. In the end, however, grilled, they were unbelievably sweet. I couldn't believe how good these very large zucchini were. I'm always of the mind that the smaller zucchini are the better ones, but I just was, I learned a lesson. And then for dessert, I had to make something with his girls because they love to cook. They love to bake. And during this coronavirus period, Brian was baking every week. And uh, one week he didn't bake, and the girls were so upset because 
what are we baking today? Well, we're not. We're going to take a rest today. Well, they didn't like that. We made strawberry shortcake together, and it's a recipe from my very first cookbook, uh, which is called Cooking in a Small Kitchen, which you may recall was republished after 40 years in print. Uh, well, it was out of print, but 40 years after the initial publication, uh, Macmillan uh, published a, uh, really it's a facsimile edition uh, called Classic Cookbooks. It's part of a series called Classic Cookbooks. I was very, very flattered that they picked mine to be in the first uh, three books, Cooking in a Small Kitchen. And, you know, as soon as they told me that they were going to do this, well, they asked if they could do it, I started cooking things from this book, which I had not cooked in a long, long time, although there are a few things in there that I cook always. I have to say I was ahead of my time with hummus. Back in 1978, I was already making hummus. Now, it's, of course, it's national passion. You can go to the supermarket and buy 15 different flavors of hummus. I, I like the classic flavor, which is nothing but uh, chickpeas and tahini and a little lemon and garlic. So um, the strawberry shortcake is not really a cake. The original, original strawberry shortcake was a shortcake. It was not a layer cake. It was not um, a fluffy cake. It's basically a biscuit. So, and by the way, I must say the biscuit, I, hadn't, I was a little nervous because I hadn't made this in 25 years. But the biscuits were sensational, and I would make those biscuits probably for other purposes, well, for other shortcakes, for sure. When when strawberries aren't in season, you can put other fruit in there. Um, and here's the, the shortcake recipe, so simple. Two cups of flour, all-purpose flour, three tablespoons of sugar, one tablespoon of baking powder, and I would say a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. I might even up that to a half a teaspoon of salt. It depends on, you know, these days we like more salt in our baked goods than we used to. In fact, in the old days, most recipes did not, for cakes, did not include salt, maybe a pinch of salt. Nowadays, we're accustomed to having that little extra oomph that salt gives to any baked good. So two cups of flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, three tablespoons of sugar, and, um, and uh, let's say a quarter of a teaspoon to a half a teaspoon of salt. You mix all the dry ingredients together. Of course, the original recipe tells you to sift them together. Not necessary. Just dump them in a bowl and, and, and stir them together so that it's homogenous. And then you cut in, and this is an interesting expression. My nephew, who is actually a very good cook, asked me about this expression, cut in. Why do you say cut in the butter? Because, in fact, you can use two knives and literally cut it in. You need six tablespoons of butter. I always start by cutting it into smaller pieces and maybe half tablespoon slices and, 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 and let that fall into the, the flour mixture. And then uh, Brian does not have a pastry blender in his uh, battery of tools, a pastry blender has is a handle with sort of stiff wire underneath it that you literally cut the butter into the flour with. Or you can use two knives, or you can do what I did yesterday, because I thought the girls would have, get a kick out of this, but in the end they didn't. Uh, you pinch in the butter. I mean, I mean take your fingertips and, sort of, uh, and, and just mush up the butter into the flour until it looks like meal. It doesn't look like pieces of butter anymore, but it should be cold butter to start. That's your basic batter mixture. The liquid ingredients are three quarters of a cup of milk. And I do this, I, I measure out the milk into a uh, measuring cup, three quarters of a cup. And then in that same cup, just so I don't have to wash something else, got to say, during this uh, coronavirus period where I was cooking up a storm, two meals a day, because what else could you get except home-cooked food, um, I was really tired of doing dishes, not so much cooking as doing the dishes. So to save a dish, to me, is an important thing. So I pour my three-quarters of a cup of milk in a measuring cup, and then I, I put in two egg yolks, not whole eggs, two egg yolks, 
and stir it together with a fork. And then in the same fork, I stir the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients. Now, you don't even have to form these biscuits. These are drop biscuits. That's actually what we call them, drop biscuits, because they are dropped off of a spoon. This recipe will make six substantial shortcakes, but we were seven yesterday with my sister. And so we, I made seven. They were all plenty big. You can probably get eight biscuits out of this. They're going to look very small when you drop them off the spoon onto a either buttered baking sheet or a parchment lined baking sheet. Uh, but they, they do, they do rise. <clears throat> and then you bake them at 425 for 15, could be hours actually took 20 minutes. Got to say, I've been telling my nephew since he moved into this house, that the stove is slow, even though it's this enormous professional level wolf stove. Um, I, 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 I immediately discovered that it takes way too long to bring water to the boil, given the strength of the stove, and that the oven is slow. So yesterday the oven was slow, and it wasn't 15 minutes. It was more like 20 minutes. They're never going to get browned. Well, if they do get browned, then you burn them. Just they only have to get tinged with brown. And you're going to see when you lift them off the sheet, the bottoms will brown. The tops will just get tinged with brown. And you take them out of the oven. Now, you can eat shortcake hot out of the oven. We didn't. We let them cool, I don't know, at least 15, 20 minutes. Maybe it was even a little longer by the time we got it all assembled. Um, in the old days, as it's written in my cookbook, Cooking in a Small Kitchen, you... Um, yeah, I buttered. I used to butter the biscuit before I put the strawberries and whipped cream on. I long ago, well, I haven't made these in a long time, but I still long ago decided that butter was gilding the lily. You didn't really need butter on these biscuits. So, by the way, the biscuits are delicious as they are, if you just want to eat them as a biscuit, as a drop biscuit. So you split the biscuits, but not with a knife. You've got to use a fork, the way we used to have to do with English muffins before they came pre-split. So you, with a, a fork, you split the shortcake on a plate, and on the bottom part of the shortcake, you put strawberries and whipped cream, and then you can put the top back on, and then you can put more strawberries and whipped cream or just some more whipped cream. You can decide how strawberry-ish, how whipped cream-ish you want your shortcakes. To make the strawberries, now this is something the girls did like because they love they have, they have knives that they're allowed to use. They're not really sharp knives. Truthfully, I think they would be better off with a sharper knife. Uh, but they have knives that their parents let them use to cut up food, you know, for cooking. And um, so that's what we did in the morning. We cut up strawberries because the strawberries you should let macerate in sugar for at least a few hours. So, they form, so the strawberries form a syrup. You add sugar to strawberries, and you get strawberries with strawberry syrup, which is what you want. So we did that early in the morning, and we let them sit all day at room temperature. You don't have to refrigerate them. And that's it. And whipped cream, which Brian insisted on using his, um, his gizmo, his, you know, one of these carbonators uh, uh, that you can use for whipped cream or, to, you know, a trendy, I don't know if it still is, not trendy anymore, but a few years ago, foams were, 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 were de rigueur in fancy restaurants, meaning they would take a sauce and put it in this carbonator and squirt it out, and it would foam up. I learned the hard way, trying to do this years ago, several years ago, that you need to have a high fat content in the sauce if you want to make a foamed sauce in the carbonator. I, um, in the case of whipped cream, you've got 31, 32% fat in heavy cream. So it works beautifully. And of course we had the squirt thing and the kids had fun getting their mouths filled with whipped cream. <laughs> They'd never see, you know, let me squirt some whipped cream into your mouth. And it really was good. By the way, I, uh, um, I have had a, a, uh, this is strawberry season. It's, even, it's I don't know if, if in Sharon they're they're harvesting strawberries yet. They used to get great strawberries. Um, I'm not in the sure. I'm not sure they're harvesting them just yet. I'm not sure. 
Really? Yeah. It's already late June. I know, but I'm, I haven't I, mean, I haven't seen any signs up, and normally I see signs up, but maybe uh, that the one farm. Maybe because of the virus, they're they're, they're not doing. Uh, I don't know, but that would be pretty safe activity, I would think. You can do social distancing in the in the strawberry field, <laughs> no problem, <laughs> and you don't even need to wear a mask if you're far enough away from everybody and you're outdoors. Around here, by the way, I, I noticed that almost everybody is wearing a mask. But this morning on um, on my Facebook feed, um, got got a, a posting from a friend who lives in Paris, and he said even though people walk around the street with masks on at night, nobody's wearing a mask on, and everybody's at the cafes and bars. So he doesn't you know understand what they're thinking. <laughs> But in New York City, everybody, I would say 98% of people are wearing a mask. And if you see somebody not wearing a mask, if you look closely, they probably have a mask hanging under their neck. And they just feel at that moment they don't need to wear it. And that's that's like me. I go take walks with Bob. And uh, when we're on a street with nobody else on it, I can take the mask off. But um, if you go into any store you in New York City, you're required to wear a mask. And there are people at the doors uh, not letting you in if you're not wearing a mask. In fact, that happened to Bob the other day. He he had the mask in his pocket. And he forgot that he had the mask in his pocket. And he didn't need it because he was walking where there was no people. But then when he got to a, a market that he needed to buy a quick item in, he, he forgot to put his mask on. And they said, no, can't come in unless you wear a mask. So that I think that's really appropriate um, uh preventative measure. Um, the, the, the doctors, the scientists are all saying it's key to stop the spread of the virus. And my, my nephew and my niece, both doctors, uh, are agreeing about that and, in fact, are pointing out that in their hospitals, they work in different hospitals, in their hospitals there have been uh, no cases of COVID among the staff, meaning nurses, techs, doctors, because they're all so well-protected and also protecting patients at the same time. And so we know that this works. And Governor Cuomo keeps using this as an example that, um, in fact, the people you would expect to have the highest incidence of COVID have the lowest incidence of COVID because they protect themselves with masks. Gloves are sort of nonsense. Did you know that, Marshall? The, The glove thing, I mean, if you touch something, first of all, you got to take the, the gloves. Gotta take, they, Just touching something is not going to get you uh, sick. It, it, but, um, but also, if you have did, to be exposed to a, a large amount of the virus to to uh, to get sick, and and the large amount would come from somebody coughing, sneezing, talking, it, it, yelling. And, and also, if if you did, you have to take the gloves off. Uh, and when you take the gloves off, unless you have gloves on to take the gloves off, <laughs> you're going to touch a portion of the glove. Right. <laughs> Actually, the, in, in the first few days before Brian told me that it's nonsense, I, I, I was taking the gloves off under the faucet, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sort of washing my hands at the same time I was taking the gloves off. But sanitizer is better. I just... You know, if you walk into a store or so, go anywhere where you think you might have, your hands might have touched something that shouldn't, just sanitize or wash if you if you're somewhere you can wash your hands for 20 seconds, that's great. I just but had, most of us most I just, don't, aren't. I just used a little uh, pencil with an eraser, and I had a uh, thing of sanitizer in the car. And, like, if I pull up to a gas pump, uh, I use the, uh, the the pencil, and I push the numbers on the pump. And then I put it in the little, uh-huh. hand, and then I put it in the little thing of sanitizer. Uh, that's what I use for, for credit card machines. Yeah, I, um the fact is, every store that I go to, has sanitized. you handle your own credit card. Nobody else handles your credit card. They've moved the credit card machines to a place where the customers can do it themselves. Um, and my supermarket, for instance, uh, besides a plastic shield between the two of us, and uh, uh, they put up racks in front of the cash registers so you really can't get closer than six feet to the cash cashier, um, I feel very safe there. And if, if, if speaking of touching things, although they say, you know, t- just touching something briefly is not going to get you sick. For one thing, you need a longer exposure or a more concentrated exposure than you're going to get from somebody just touching it. But um, if you bring your own shopping bags 
which in New York City, you now the stores are, uh, don't give out bags, not plastic bags for sure, and or, and if it's a paper bag, which they usually are now. It's a it'll cost you a nickel, or maybe even ten cents. I'm not sure. My store it's a nickel. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, they, if you bring your own bags, you have to pack your own bag. If you let them, if they use a new bag, they'll pack it for you on the other side of the plastic, you know, and then hand it through a slot. So all we do, all these things, and I guess we're going to be doing all these things for quite a while. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so uh, strawberry shortcake, I recommend it as soon as the strawberries are local. You have to do strawberry shortcake. There's a, a, I must say, I find, since I'm, I'm a strawberry guy, I love strawberries, and, and, and my, my little nieces love strawberries. Um, Brian stopped buying strawberries because they were so sour. And there are a lot of really bad strawberries out there, I've got to say, <laughs> even those Driscoll the branded strawberries. But Driscoll, I'm sure knowing that, now has a superior variety of strawberry that they're packing in boxes that say Driscoll. And I only accidentally bought those um, last week because I ordered from Fresh Direct, and you don't know what you get. Well, I should have known what I was getting because it was very clear on the website. But I got these strawberries, and they were sensational. And they were Driscoll's, too. So um, Brian said, oh, I stopped by. Then Michelle chirped in. That's my niece. She said, oh, I know where to buy the good strawberries. So we had the good strawberries, which, in fact, don't really need sugar. But the only reason I put sugar on them, cut them up and put sugar on them, is so that we get lots of nice syrup to drench the bottom of the biscuit. I think that's an important part of strawberry oh, shortcake. Oh, the biscuit has <laughs> got to have, that's exactly right, that strawberry juice in it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. So actually, we have, we have some uh, leftover. We, we, we did, like, I don't know, at least at least uh, a quart and a half. The rest, I think the recipe in cooking in a small kitchen only calls for a quart. But since everybody loves strawberries, we did a, a quart and a, and a pint. And uh, we have some leftovers, so I'm going to go put them in my breakfast cereal. And you used you used uh, fresh whipped cream with it, right? Of course. Yeah. My, my, I, let me, let you, me say that the girl's nanny, Joyce, who I love, Joyce introduced them to Cool Whip. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> my niece and nephew were not happy about that when they learned this <laughs> last night. That the girls had, oh, is this cool? Sydney said, is this Cool Whip or real whipped cream? I said, no, this is real whipped cream. We would never use Cool Whip. She says, well, Joyce gave me some Cool Whip, and it really tasted good. Oh, so. <laughs> it, it, I, you know, my, grand, my grandmother would put Cool Whip on Jello, but anything she baked that required whipped cream, it was whipped cream. It was whipped and cream. And by the way, we, we, we uh, yeah, no, it's got to be whipped cream. I, I don't like Cool Whip yeah. at all. <laughs> I remember Cool Whip, but I haven't had it in 30 years, probably. It's not a new product. No. I mean, to me, it was a new. It was new when we were kids, Marshall. It was. Pro it's probably that, made out of some sort of petrol material. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how many years ago. I have to I look know. that up when Cool Whip was invented. 30 years ago? No, it's more than that. It's got to be 40. Probably, it's got to be 40 or 50. Uh, I'm old, so it's probably 50 years yeah, ago. it's got to be, because I'm 67, and I know I had it when I was, uh, like, 9 or 10 years old, so it's got to be, you know, like, 50 or 60 years old. Yeah, yeah. How old are you? I'm 67. Oh, getting up there. <laughs> yeah, I certainly I, am. <laughs> I, 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 uh, this new phone that I have, which I don't like, it's an Android kind of phone, um, I can't seem to shut off the Facebook notifications. Oh. Uh oh, <laughs> and so early this morning I got a notification and I actually looked at it, and it was my friend Veronica from Italy. She Battipaglia is the town, just south of Salerno, and I it really made me feel old because Veronica, who I know since she's nineteen, and was dating her now husband. They've been married a long time. Just turned fifty. So when your kid turned 50, you know you're old. Yeah, I always remember my mother sitting in uh, a, 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 a nursing home at the end when she had uh, dementia and was going towards, uh, and she would sit there and she'd say, 
Look at all these old people. <laughs> look at look at her. Like, Mom, I hate well, to tell I, you. Well, as I've been saying, and I can say this now about Veronica, is that all the young people are old now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, Bob, I can't, I just this just came out of my mouth some weeks ago when Bob said, "Oh, did you know?" And he was some actor just turned 60 how could he be 60 i said well all the young people are old now it's amazing how time and flies I'm, oh gosh well, um, so so you're having fun yeah, in Doc is right yeah. so you're but having... we're still we're, we're still trucking here and you're on the radio i'm on the radio and we're listening to the birds in the morning it's nice you can't complain exactly right no i can't complain so we're back to we're going back to brooklyn today uh, while we were gone, I had the apartment cleaned by my housekeeper, who she herself has tested negative, positive for antibodies, negative for the virus. But everybody in her household has been sick. So we're a little nervous. I mean, they're not sick now. Yeah, yeah. In fact, her husband was sick before we even knew it was a virus. He, it, it ends up he got sick in February, late February. Yeah. And um, we had no idea what was going on. Only in retrospect, we realized that he had COVID in, in, in late February. And he got over it. He was sick for a week, um, and then he got over it. But still, you know, to be precautious here, um, Irene is coming today while we're gone. And I'm not going to worry about touching things that she touched because no. No. all the scientists say that you're not going to get the virus by touching stuff. No, you're, you're okay. You're okay. I'll be fine. And the apartment will be clean. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the most I could do and Bob could do is one room in a day. And then, of course, by the time you get to the next room, the last room is dirty again. That's right. <laughs> we have a lot of dust in Brooklyn. There's a lot of dust ups. And also, I must say, there, there's been, since I live in a place that a, 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 has large open space, Prospect Park, Grand Army Plaza, the plaza in front of the Barclays Center is only a quarter of a mile away. Uh, we have, we, we're, we're protest central. Yes. <laughs> and some, some of it has been nice, actually, because, I mean, some of it's just noisy. But I don't know who it is, but there's a, like a, a drumming band that's been part of these <laughs> protests, and they, they're really quite accomplished. I can hear them in my apartment, um, <laughs> even though they're drumming three blocks away. Gotta love New York. Gotta well, love New York. Back to Brooklyn today. We have a new car. What would you get? We have a new car. We're back to Subaru. All right. When I say back to Subaru, when we first moved to Cornwall, um, we had a we had a like a, a nineteen I don't know what year it was, but it was an old old Oldsmobile. We used to call it a uh, a land yacht. Yeah. Uh, it was my uncle's car. He gave it to me when we moved to Connecticut, and um, he had to have a car. Um, and then we gave up on that. It was, it was such a gas guzzler and it was way too big. So we bought, uh, we would, but when we were driving around, Bob would say, it looks like somebody's following us. Well, nobody was following. It's just that everybody in the northwest corner has a Subaru. Yeah. So, and, and that time, blue Subaru. So <laughs> it was always a blue Subaru behind us. So when we got rid of that car, we got a Subaru, and we and it, and it, it saved our lives, that car, because we had a rollover accident on Route 7. Don't ask. Right next to the river, and um, and we were fine. We had minor, minor, minor injuries, but we could have been dead, dead, dead. Yeah. So we really were grateful to our Subaru. And then we bought another Subaru. But then when we sold our house in Connecticut, I thought, well, maybe it's time for a city car. And we got an Infinity, and 18 years with the Infinity, um, and we now have another Subaru. All right. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I don't get excited about cars because my father was a mechanic and an auto restore. He used to buy old cars and restore them, and so his whole life was cars. So that was my form of rebellion, <laughs> not to be interested in cars. Food, you ch you chose. Uh, so thing. I still I still have trouble, you know, getting any enthusiasm for a car, but it's nice. All right, well, have a safe trip, right. have a safe trip back. I will, and we will talk again, and of course. <laughs> All right. And by the way, do you know I have only missed four, maybe it's three programs 
I was trying to count three or four shows I've missed in 14 years. Yeah, not not many at all. And no, and, not many and, at all. Even today, when I forgot to tell you I was in Pennsylvania, <laughs> uh, you found me. Oh, well, Jill, Jill, Jill can track anybody down. <laughs> yeah, well, no, she has my cell number. Yeah. So I knew I knew that she would track me down. All right, so, all all right. right. it's 8:05, everybody. So uh-huh. it's time for Arthur to go. All right, Arthur, we'll speak to you next week. Take care. Take care. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven here this morning on Robin Hood Radio. Of course, you can follow Arthur online, robinhoodradio.com. Click on On Demand, Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467. On the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheese Mongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488. Rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef. More information, 518-325. 5, 7, HGSHomeChef.com